Hey, welcome. I'm Pastor John Boyacek, and this is Fairview Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us for a slice of what Fairview life is all about. We want you to be here and be part of what God is doing in this community. I don't know about you, but I appreciate it when people have certain standards. If I'm flying in a commercial airline, I, I, I'd like to think that the uh, pilots would have pretty high standards in terms of passing their, their, their schooling and other things like that. So, you know, I, I, finding out that the pilot only made two out of the three landings in this last simulator, I don't know if I want to fly with that guy. I, I kind of want a perfect score about perfect landings. I have high standards for certain individuals. I, I, I think of surgeons. I kind of want them graduating at the top of their class. You know, I don't want them saying, you know, I've done this surgery hundreds of times and about 80% of them are pretty successful. In fact, last week I was a little bit distracted and I forgot to stitch the person up. You know, you don't want somebody like that. You want high standards. Or even at a bank. Well, you know what? Last week we lost all the savings from this one person. Ah, it was just a technical glitch. Oh, well. Those things happen. No! I, I want you handling my money perfectly. We, we have these high standards. We do. Or, or even at a restaurant. I want that chef using clean utensils. I, I, I want the kitchen at a high standard for cleanliness. When I go get my Big Mac, I want my Big Mac to taste like a Big Mac. <laughs> if it doesn't, I, I'm not going back. Let's face it, we, we all appreciate high standards. Now, not everything do, do we say we, we need to have uh, high standards um, there are some things that we let slide. For instance, watching a group of 10-year-olds play soccer or hockey, if you're at the sidelines, you're not going to say, come on, why'd you miss that shot? You should have gotten it. You know, you should have gone in the corner. Oh. If you're like that, you're a bad parent. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, we want our kids to have certain high standards, but they're not professional players. They just aren't. And, and when it comes to the Christian life, should we have high standards? Should we have high standards? As believers, we, 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 we live within this tension of law and grace. Of law and grace. And, and there's this aspect of grace of, as Jesus has come and, and, and paid the price for our sins and, and taken those dark blots out for us, and there's really nothing we can do to get to God. And, and because Jesus has done it all, that's, that's because of his grace, the great gift that he's given to us. We, we have that side, but then we have law. And, and, and the law is certain standards that we need to live by, because God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. And we need to live up to certain standards. We, we live within this tension. And God does have high standards. He has very high standards. We've been doing a series this summer called Summer in the Psalms, looking at different psalms, and uh, we looked at Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Today we're going to jump over to Psalm chapter 15, Psalm 15, and, and these are songs that were sung, the people of God would have sung, sometimes going into the temple, going to worship, sometimes for, for different reasons. We don't know what the tunes were. The tunes are, are forgotten. The, the, these are poetry, um, and, and some of these psalms rhyme, but they rhyme in the original language Hebrew. And these were important things, important worship psalms for life. And Psalm 15 is a psalm that probably would have been said by the priest before he went into the temple, probably would have been said by different worshipers as they came to the temple. It's a psalm of reflection. 
A psalm of self-examination. A, a psalm that they would have even said going into the tabernacle or temple to worship. It's pretty short. It's pretty simple. Asking a simple question and giving a simple answer. Really simple answers. If you have your Bibles, just follow along as I read. It says this. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous. Who speaks the truth from their heart. Whose tongue utters no slander. Who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others. Who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord. Who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest. Who does not accept a bride against the innocent. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. This is God's word. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, as we just look into this, this passage, thank you for it. Thank you for the certain standards that you have set for your people to be holy people, to be a people of God. And Lord, as we examine this, I, I pray that you would turn our hearts more towards you and cause us to examine our hearts, our lives, our heads, our minds, our, our bodies, and what we're doing with them. Bless us as we look in this now. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage asks basically a question, who may enter God's presence? Who may enter God's presence? Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may dwell in your tabernacle, the, the place of worship that the people of Exodus would go into, uh, the, the, the people of David the, uh, up to Solomon? Who may live on your holy mountain and where, where the tabernacle dwelt? And, and who may go into your presence? Who may go before God's throne? Who may even pray to him? Who, who may worship him? And so there, there are ten things mentioned here. Ten requirements of, of, of people. Now this is not an exhaustive list, but it makes a point about a fellowship with God. For someone to have fellowship with God, you must have high standards. And as we look at this list, and as we're going to break it down in just a few moments, I don't think many of us would say this list is unrealistic. It, it really isn't unrealistic. It, it, it's not like the standards are too high or, 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 or you're asking me to do this big project that's just beyond myself. I can't do it. Or you're asking me to have a certain skill set that I'm just not gifted for. And many times we, we, we say that about certain things. I, I can't be a pilot. I can't. My eyes just aren't right. I'm colorblind. They won't let me fly. I wanted to fly, but they won't let me fly. I, there are certain skill sets I don't have. And sometimes when it comes to being people of God, we say, there are certain skill sets I don't have. I, I, I don't think I could do this, God. But that's not what this passage is saying. You know, some people say, well, you know, I, I, I gotta, it's kind of like throwing 30 shots from the free throw line and getting them all in at the same time. That's God's standard, isn't it? No, it's not. Or, or just hitting the bullseye all the time. That's God's standards. Or, or, or doing some type of feat of endurance where I have to make a trek from here down to Mexico in the middle of winter. Uh, you know, it just, it just something ridiculous. Those are the types of standards God's had. No. No, the, the standards aren't unrealistic. You don't need a skill set. You don't even need endurance. You, you don't need a high IQ. You, you don't need a great education. In fact, you, you don't even need an education. In fact, even a child can do these things that are required of the people of God. And in fact, this list hardly has to do with certain rituals towards God. It's not like it says, well, you have to bow down to the ground seven times before you come into the temple. Or, or, or you must be on your knees a certain way for a certain time. Or... or, or or your heart and your devotion to God must look like this. It, it, it doesn't give those type of requirements either. In fact, the list here, the list here 
to stand in the presence of God, something else needs to be right. It's interesting. It's, it's all about your relationship to others, not necessarily your relationship to God. It, it's your relationship to others. As Jesus said, the, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Saying loving your neighbor matters. Loving your neighbor matters. I, I hear people often telling me, and you've heard this too, people who don't attend the church, it, it, you know, it, it, it's me and God. It's me and God that matters the most. Well, it's extremely important, don't get me wrong. But it's also you and others that is very important too. Your relationship with others. Believers need a community and living right in that community. Believers in Jesus Christ within Scripture were always part of, of, of a community of believers. They lived in a community of believers. They, 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 they went to church. They were part of God's Christ's bride, the church. And, and being with other people, unfortunately, we have challenges. And it takes work keeping relationships right with other people. And, and these standards are, 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 are things that I think all of us would like to see in other people. As we go through this thing, yeah, yeah I want to see this in my spouse. Yeah, I, I want to see this with my neighbor. I, I want to see this in the person beside me. These the, the standards aren't like, whoa, they're, they're just unbelievably high. They're quite practical, as a matter of fact. And not only should we see it in the person beside us, we should see it in us. As we do business with others, as we have other conversations with others, as we interact with others, I, I, I think we, we almost assume that people live by these ten standards until they don't. These standards are attainable. So let's look at them. The first one's pretty high, mind you. It, it tells us uh, the one whose walk is blameless. The one whose walk is blameless. The, the idea of walking, living in, in, in a course of action. A, as you go along, you're, you're blameless. A person of, of integrity, of sound, of even temperedness, someone who's flawless. And I think most of us can stop here and say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not flawless all the time. If you talk to your spouse, I think your spouse might say, yeah, things don't measure up all the time. If you ask your children, your children might say, yeah, dad, things don't measure up all the time. And, 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 and we can stop right there, but it, this one's a tough one. Are we blameless? Whose walk is blameless? And he says, hey, we need to aim for that. The next one is, the next one is, um, their, their life must be characterized by doing righteous acts. Righteous acts. This is about doing what's morally or ethically right. Ethnic, ethically right. It's with the person... It's with the person who, who doesn't sin sexually with their thoughts or with their actions or with pornography or sexual morality. There's that aspect of purity. It's the person who fills their minds with good things. It's the person who speaks good words and, and they do kind things. They do righteous acts instead of evil acts. It's a person who speaks the truth sincerely. This is a person who speaks reliably and, and dependable with their speech. Uh, uh, what it says, reality. They, they, their report is honest and reliable. Their, their report's also from the heart. They, they speak from the heart. and The place where decisions and their intentions are formed. Sincerity and, and accuracy. In his book, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, How We Lie to Everyone, Especially Ourselves, that's quite a book, Dan Arley, talks about our tendency to be dishonest when we're in a tough spot. And Pastor John Ortberg writes about this in his book, Soul Keeping. He says, Arlie Books clearly gives empirical verification for you and I know what happens all the time. And here's a tiny example I hope you cannot relate to. Arlie says, over the course of many years of teaching, I have noticed 
that there are typically seems to be a rash of deaths among students' relatives at the end of semester. It happens mostly in the week before final exams or before papers are due. Guess which relative most often dies? Grandma. I'm not making this stuff up. Another research study has shown that grandmothers are often 10 times more likely to die before a midterm <laughs> and 19 times more likely to die before a final exam. Worse, grandmothers of students who are not doing well in class are often even higher risk. <laughs> students who are failing often uh, are 50 more times likely to lose grandma than non-failing students. It turns out that the greatest predictor of mortality among senior citizens in our day ends up being grandchildren's grade point averages. So the moral of all this is, if you're a grandparent, do not let your grandchild go to college. <laughs> it will kill you. Especially if they're intellectually challenged. People are liars when the pressure's on. Students do that. There's nothing sincere about that truth. <laughs> I'm lying about my grandma. Probably the person who loves you the most. This person's yes means yes. This person's so well known for their honesty that if they have to take an oath in court, the, the person who's taking the oath says, yeah, you know, this person, they, they don't have to swear because <laughs> their yes is yes and their no is no. When they say the check is in the mail, the check is in the mail. When they say, I'll be there tomorrow, they'll be there tomorrow. They, they speak the truth. They speak the truth sincerely and from the heart. And, and the next one is, whose tongue utters no slander. Whose tongue utters no slander. It, it's putting someone down to make yourself look better. That's, that's what slander is. It brings great harm to the person you're speaking about. It's spreading damaging gossip to, uh, and, and untrue or unverified stories about a person. And I hear people say, yeah, but, but it's true. Slander brings harm. Slander brings harm. Did you hear the story about Bill cheating on his wife? I saw him walking down the street with, with so-and-so and, and another woman. I, they're cheating. I, I, I just know that. What? It's slander. Or, Mary, you know, I, I, I think she's drunk again. I, I, I'm pretty sure she was soaring sur speech the other day. Slander. You know, that person, I heard that person hates Christians. Did they say it? Is this slander? Or, 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 or that person's untrustworthy. Why do I need to know that? Uh, it's just spewing out bad things about people. I'm not looking for a character ref reference. I'm, I, I'm not looking to, to hire the person. I'm just calling you to find out if this person would make a good candidate to hire. I, that, no, these people are just spewing slander about people for no good reason at all. Listening to the news these days drives me crazy at times. Andrew Scheer hates immigrants and natives and loves only rich people. Slander. Or, or Justin Trudeau loves abortion, wants to empower criminals and tear the country apart. Slander. Both sides are slanderous. Watching the news doesn't help either. Whose tongue utters no slander. They do no wrong to their neighbor. The person uh, does no evil to people around them. They don't do something that causes harm or pain to other people. The righteous person has the good in mind of their neighbor. When the trash blows onto your lawn, you don't take it and throw it on your neighbor's lawn, okay? Uh, it, you don't do something to agitate your neighbor just to say, for the sake of agitating you look for ways to bless. 
it's easy to do wrong to someone. And, and, and a true worshiper just doesn't do it. They, they look for ways to bless. And sometimes, sometimes our words might hurt a neighbor. But our, our motives are noble in the end. Sometimes our words might hurt a neighbor, but our motives are, are noble in the end. Proverbs 27, 6 says this. It says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Uh, sometimes a good neighbor, a, a good friend, causes some hurt in order to correct the person, in order to help the person, in, in order to bring healing to the person. And sometimes we have to have difficult words with a good friend in order to bring healing. But for the most part, we're not someone who brings harm with our words, with our actions. The sixth one says, cast no slur on others. This is a cutting taunt, a sharp criticism, a personal attack. It's cursing someone with, with our words, either swear words or, or with an attitude. You know, boy, that person did a bad job. Wow. Uh, uh, person's an idiot. It's, it's, what, what a fool. You know, it just, just condemning people. We, we don't cast slurs on others. Next one says, who despises a vile person. Now, just a second here. Okay. Number six was... You don't cast a slur on others. In this one, you're, you're calling somebody vile. Well, well, then no, they're not necessarily calling somebody vile. They, they despise a vile person. In, in a way, you're saying this is a contradiction, but no, some, some people are vile. Even though they're vile, you don't necessarily cast a slur on them. Now, this isn't a rule for grade three teachers, okay? Some third graders can be a little vile. Okay, they can. I, I've worked with third graders at times, okay? And, and sometimes the teachers can say, no, these are the precious ones. These are the vile ones. No. No, as a grade three teacher, you need to help the vile ones to become better people, okay? That, that's, that's the thing. Um, I used to have a grade 10 teacher in high school, and, and he would call some of my fellow grade 10 students horrible little wretches. <laughs> you horrible little wretch. I, from the, from the front to my friend. He was a grade 10. He goofed around a bit, but he was a typical grade 10 student. They, casting a slur like that, no. This is dealing with adults. But let's get the full context here. It says, it says this. Um, who despises a vile person, but, but honors those who fear the Lord. They honor those who fear the Lord. They, there, there's a contrast here. Okay, you despise, despise a vile person, but you honor those who fear the Lord. The contrast is despised and honor. In comparison to each other, the righteous ones who do the good things need to be honored. And, 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 and the vile person should not come to any type of honor. Turns out our, our society tends to honor the vile. You know, most of our rock stars these days got to their place in life by being vile. Drugs, sex, and just terrible living. And, and oh, there are rock stars, there are idols. And many of our movie stars are known for immorality, broken relationships, and stepping on people. And, 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 and they're idolized. Really bad behavior. What do we honor? What do we honor? Do we honor the vile person? Do we honor the people who who are godly, who fear the Lord. Our society has it backwards. Who keeps an oath and does not change their mind. Who keeps an oath and does not change their mind. You know, in the comforts of our easy chair, we can say things we really mean. I will never give in to that, that temptation. I will never try things like drugs or, 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 or get drunk. I, I, I will never do that evil deed. In grade six, I remember the police officer coming in and talking about the evils of drugs. And basically, we all took an oath saying, no, we will never touch drugs. We, we won't touch drugs. That was grade six. In well, grade eight, grade nine, some of my friends, who I was in grade six with, were dealing drugs. Just, you, don't you remember the oath you took in grade six? 
when the pressure came, when the temptation came, they, they broke their oath. They broke the oath. The temptation was stronger than the oath. And some people are very quick to jump to promises. I promise you I'll do this next week. Or, or, or Jesus implied, don't make too many oaths. Instead of let your yes be yes and your no be no. And, and, and some people are quick. I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God, I swear to God. And, uh, nah, don't be quick to make oaths. Probably a few oaths that you only need to make in life. There are the marriage oaths. It says who keeps their oaths, um, it, it says, who keeps an oath even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. Even when it hurts. Sometimes marriage oaths hurt. I, I, I don't like what we're going through right now. I don't even like my spouse right now. But I made an oath. I don't feel this oath. <laughs> I don't feel it, but I made it, and I'll keep it beyond this hurt, beyond this pain. It's interesting. We admire people like war heroes who were captured during the war. Maybe they were spies. Maybe they were soldiers, and, and, and they were taken, and they're, and they're interrogated by the other side. And during their interrogation, they're beaten and they're tortured and, and they're bruised and, they're, and, and, and they're, they're hurt and fingernails being ripped off and, and they're scarred. But they did not give in. They kept their oath. They, they kept their promise. They kept that secret. And we say, they're a hero. And they walk with a limp for the rest of their lives. They're a hero. They're a, yeah. But when it comes to marriage, when it comes to making those oaths, do we keep them even if they hurt? Are we a hero that way? Bill McCarthy, founders of Promise Keepers, said this. He says, when I took the job as the head football coach of the University of Colorado in 1982, I made a solemn promise. I told everybody that with me, God was first, family second, and football third. And he says, but I didn't keep that promise very long. The thrill and the challenge of resurrecting a football program in disarray simply took too much time and attention. My teams kept winning year after year, and I kept losing focus on my priorities. When we won the national championship in 1990, many people said that I had reached the pinnacle of my profession. But for me, there was an emptiness about it. I had everything a man could want, and yet something was missing. I was so busy pursuing my career goals that I was missing out of the spirit-filled life that God wanted me to have. And because I had broken my promise to put God first and foremost in my life. You keep your promises. You keep your oaths, even if they hurt. Next one is, they don't take advantage of the poor. It says, who lends money to the poor without interest. The Hebrew reads literally, they don't lend money out with a bite. They don't lend money out with a bite. They give to those who are in need. They may loan without interest. They would, may give without even expecting it back. Does someone owe you money? Does someone owe you something that they can't repay? Just give it to them. Give it to them. Don't try taking a bite. They give money to the poor without interest. And finally, who does not accept a bribe? Who does not accept a bribe? They preserve justice. They don't perverse it for gain. They preserve justice. It doesn't necessarily mean that the bribe is an envelope of money. Uh, it, it can be doing a deed for someone so that they'll, they'll turn a blind eye to you in the future. When I was with uh, our team down in Haiti a number of years ago, we talked with some of the workers who were working with the local hospital there, re building a new hospital there. And they told us a story about how somebody generous gave a Range Rover over to them uh, to use for their ministry. And they sent it to Haiti. And it was on the docks of Haiti there. 
So they went to get it, and it turned out they had to pay a bribe to get their, their uh, Range Rover, this beautiful vehicle. And they went there, and, and they realized it wasn't a tariff or a tax. It was a bribe. And they refused to do it. And when we were there, it had been sitting on the docks for a number of years already. The, the missionary refused to pay that bribe. Refused. In fact, it's probably still on the dock today. Because... They refuse to pay the bribe. And, and the Haiti is just filled with so much corrupt, corruption. I'll line your pockets, you line my pockets, and we'll all get along. And, and, and the place is a mess. It's still a mess. We're seeing some positive things happen, even in the ministry that we're involved in. But it, it's, the justice system breaks down when it goes like that. For people to say, what will it take for this problem to go away? Here's the money. The, the problem that I'm seeing within our country in our justice system is that those with money get a different form of justice than those without. I've had personal experience with this, talking to people who don't have money, who can't find justice. Lots of money gets you a good lawyer who finds loopholes and, and not justice at times. And we need more lawyers and more people to stand for justice in, in our country, no matter the cost. People are willing to do things for money, for a moment of fame, for, 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 for a moment of, 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 of just looking better in front of people. People are willing to lie against the innocent for a moment of fame. Remember King Ahab? He, he hired some people to lie about Naboth because King Ahab wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard and Naboth wouldn't sell it to him. So he hired some people to say some bad things about him so he could kill Naboth and take his vineyard. Jesus, when he was being put on trial, the priest hired some people to lie about Jesus to bring a ju false judgment on him. These people wanted to look good in the eyes of the priest. Bribery comes in many forms. And God hates it. And so you have ten things. Ten things. And it says this. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Whoever is living this way will abide in the Lord and will be secure. They will go from strength to strength to strength. Because they're, they're living these things out in view of God. With sin in your life, with impurity in your life, th th there is no security. You're always looking over your shoulder. Oh yeah, okay, what lie did I tell that person the other day? I, I, I can't keep it straight anymore. Well, why is that person mad at me again? I, I, oh, it's because I said that about them. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, what am I being accused of now? Always looking over your back. Always nervous. Really no clear conscience. Even in death, as they come to death, there, there, there'll be no rest. When we say rest in peace, throughout their lives they were always looking over their shoulders because they, they, they weren't living up to these standards here. And, and, and they won't have eternal peace either in the presence of God. And the psalm is saying, let, let's deal with these things. The, the psalm is saying it, it's about confession, it's about repentance, it's about having a pi price paid. And so they would go to the temple and they would recite this, this, this passage and, and, and it would bring to their mind and say, oh God, I, I have fallen short. I wanted to walk righteously and pure. I want to be blameless. You know, I, 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 I did not take that bribe, but I did this other thing. And so as they would go into the temple, and part of the reason for going to the temple in those days was to perform a sacrifice, to realize that we're sinful people. And they'd go in and they'd bring their lamb or they'd bring their goat, and they would place their hands on it and says, I'm giving my sin over to God and I'm sacrificing this, this animal for the payment of my sin. Something has to die in place of my sin to deal with my sin. And time after time, 
as they would recite this psalm, they would realize, no, some things are getting better, but it's almost like playing whack-a-mole. Once when you get one sin down, another one pops up. And, 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 and it's this constant struggle. And year after year, they would go to the temple and they would recite this, and they would realize, yeah, I got I to gotta worship God, and the way I got to worship God is for some blood to be spilled. I confess my sins. He'll forgive them, but this blood has to be spilled. And God had a better plan. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who, who, who lived out these, these ten things perfectly, who showed us how to do it perfectly. And he went to the cross because God had a plan for him to be the perfect sacrifice, to die on the cross for our sins. To pay the price so that we can be righteous before God. So that we can be justified. We can be declared righteous in His sight. Because of what He did on the cross for us. He brings cleansing. He brings forgiveness. He, he helps us through this. He gives power to, to, to help us to live our lives more righteously and, and blamelessly. God has this entrance standard. It, it is practical. In fact, it, it's, the entrance standards are things that we desire from our neighbors. In fact, they're, they're things that we desire from our fellow citizens. We, we want people around us living these things. And it's something that desire, God desires from us. The question is, are you living it? Are, are there certain things that you need to deal with? In order, before you even go to prayer before God, may, maybe there's certain people you need to deal with, certain, certain wrongs that you need to make right. Confess them to God, confess them to others, and, and deal with them. Have you had Christ help you to deal with these sin issues? These standards, why are they here? Well, in a way, it shows us God's love for us. It shows God's love for us and for his people and how we're supposed to live together. God's standards are there for, because he loves us. You know, I recall when I brought my first child home, Ben. This isn't a picture of him. But it's not his picture. But, but I was warned that I would not be able to bring Ben home if I didn't have a certified car seat with me. And they have to check it out. And I thought to myself, wow, things have changed. I remember when my baby brother and baby sister came home from the hospital. My mom and dad, they carried my baby brother and sister in the car like this. Right? Some of you remember that. And I said, why, why, why did they have to be so strict? They, they won't give me my child if I don't have a proper car seat. Things have changed. Can't we have just the good old days the way things were? But the fact is, in the good old days, there were car accidents. Children were killed needlessly because we didn't practice good safety standards. In fact, the reason why we have these car seats is, is to practice good safety standards to save children's lives in the unfortunate event of an accident. And in fact, these rules are here to show love for the most precious gift, our, our children. And laws were in place to protect innocent children and give standards for parents to live by. And you know, God has the same, and knows the same is true of our love and our devotion towards Him and other people. He knows that our feelings are not just enough. We need laws and boundaries to live by in forms of command to aid us in loving Him and loving people fully. You see, God gives a standard of holiness. God tells us what's best for us. And may those standards be reflected in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the standards you've called us to. And we all admit that we fall short time and time again. But thank you that you're the God of second, third, fourth, and fifth chances. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've come to show us the way, the way to live these things out. 
Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came and paid the price for our failures, for our sins. Lord, I, I pray that you'd help us to examine our lives, to continue to examine our lives, because you, you demand holiness. You demand purity. You demand righteousness. And you want us to walk beside others, living this out. Lord, if there's some things that um, we need to have changed I, in our lives, I, I pray that you'd help us to confess our sins to one another and find other people who could pray for us to help us through some of these challenges that face us, these sinful challenges that face us. Thank you for your word and the standard that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you know what? We are a community that loves Jesus, and we want you to be part of this. Feel free to give us a call or even drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you.